Every summer when I was a kid, I would spend a week with my grandparents on their farm in the rural community of Estella, Tennessee. They grew up without electricity and running water. They didn't have a bathroom until a year after they moved into the house my mom grew up in. The same house where this story takes place. It was the early 1990s and they still didn't have air conditioning. If you're not familiar, it gets really hot and humid in Tennessee during the summers, so every door and window would be open at their house, along with fans running 24-7, which made a nice white noise that still makes me drowsy to this day. We were getting ready for bed and all but asleep on this particularly muggy evening. Often, I would sleep in the front bedroom with Mima, mainly because Papa was a heavy snorer and they rarely slept in the same bed anymore. Before I go any further, I should explain some of the layout of their house. One half of the house's layout is comprised of a front and back bedroom, with a bathroom in between, all connected by a hallway. Across the hallway from the bathroom is a door that goes to the living room. The living room also has an exterior door that leads to the front porch. On the porch, directly perpendicular to the living room front door, is an exterior door to the front bedroom where I was laying that night. Again, every door and window is open this time of year. Nothing but a screen separated us from the summer night's symphonic melody of chirps, bleeps, ribbits, and screeches softly cadencing through the darkness. As I lay there, drifting off, I could hear the soft rumblings of Papa's snores echoing down the hallway, intertwining with the sound of running water in the bathroom sink, where Mima was finishing getting ready for bed. I can remember laying there half awake, looking out through the screen of the bedroom window next to me. I could see the bathroom light dimly cast across the lawn just outside the bathroom window. Little did I know that one of the blurred shadows that my gaze had crossed contained something sinister, and only a flimsy screen mesh separated us from it. I must have dozed off for just a second, or the hum from all the fans running masked the sound of the front living room door slowly creaking open. I awoke to the sound of Mima's voice. She sounded annoyed as she said with a raised tone, In a minute, Welton, addressing my papa by his first name. Immediately after was a loud bang on the bathroom door, as if struck by two large fists, followed by a series of large thuds moving through the living room. A half second later, the living room storm door swung open, crashing into the exterior door to the bedroom where I was. There was one deep, bounding thud on the front porch before the living room storm door slammed shut sending our dog Blue into full assault mode. She ran off, viciously growling after something, until she went out of earshot and the nighttime summer sounds softly refilled the air. I remember wondering what Papa was doing making all that noise. I thought to myself, maybe he heard a raccoon or something in the garden. Then I noticed the drone of his snores still softly echoing from his bedroom. Before I had the chance to speculate further, Mima came into the room and asked me if I'd just tried to open the bathroom door. I replied, no, that I had been in bed the whole time, and I asked her about all the noises, but without acknowledging me, she turned and walked to the back bedroom where my papa was still sleeping. She woke him, and they spoke quietly for several minutes. Then she returned to the room and got into the bed laid down and went to sleep without saying anything. I'm not sure why, but the next morning I never asked about it. Everything seemed business as usual at breakfast, and I was distracted with the excitement of the day's activities on the farm. Besides that, as a ten-year-old boy, my papa was a pretty intimidating man, and he slept with a loaded shotgun by the bed. Our dog, she was only 50 pounds, was fearless and would run full-grown cattle like they were kittens. They really gave me a false sense of security. 
I eventually forgot about it until around 15 years later when I was in my mid-twenties. I was visiting with Mima and she asked me if I remembered that night. I told her I vaguely did and that I remember her calling out, in a minute, Welton, probably because it was unusual to hear her speak in that tone of voice. She chuckled warmly for just a moment, but then her expression faded to a serious one. She told me that several years before I was born, she had served on a jury for a murder trial. The man that was convicted spent 20 years in jail. She said that when the verdict was being read, she looked up, and he was just staring at her. She wasn't sure why, but he continued to glare at her while he stood there being sentenced, but she never forgot it. A week before my annual summer visit in June of 1992, she received word that he had recently been released. A few days prior to my arrival, she received a couple of phone calls where she could just hear someone breathing, and then they would hang up without saying a word. She said she just knew it was him and thought of telling my mom not to send me, but she felt a little silly and had no reason to suspect this man even remembered her, let alone where she lived. She told me that she'd locked the bathroom door that night because I was there. She didn't want me to accidentally walk in on her while she was changing into her nightgown. Any other time, the door would have been unlocked like all the other doors and windows. I guess when the man tried to open the door and she yelled out, in a minute, Welton, it was enough to spook him out of doing whatever it was that he'd initially intended when he entered our house that summer night. She said she could imagine him standing out in the darkness, peering into the illuminated bathroom window, a predator stalking his prey in all her vulnerability separated only by a thin, hollow, wooden bathroom door that could have easily been kicked in. Maybe it was the deep rumblings of Papa's snoring billowing from the next room, reminding him that there wasn't just an older lady by herself. Maybe our dog got a piece of him as she escorted him off the property that night. Regardless, he never came back. Though none of that would have mattered if she hadn't locked the bathroom door. And had she not, our night could have ended very, very differently. This happened back in 2021. For some background, I'm a male, and I was 19 at the time. I was studying at university in Canberra. I'm not from the area, having come down from Brisbane, which is about a thousand kilometers away. I was living in a student dorm, cheapest one available, about a two-minute walk from the campus. I had terrible insomnia, so every night I would still be up until like 5 a.m. The Wi-Fi was so awful in the dorm which meant that most nights I would venture to the university library and use the free Wi-Fi to keep myself entertained. On this particular night, it was around 2 a.m. in the middle of winter. I packed my laptop and headphones and walked outside into the zero-degree Canberra winter night. As soon as I leave the dorm, there was a young woman standing on the pathway about five meters away from me. She looked to be my age, so I assumed she was another student like me. Immediately, her demeanor was frantic. She seemed very on edge, pacing a bit. I'm a pretty resolved person, to the point where I think I come across as standoffish, but being the middle of the night and freezing outside, I asked if she was okay. She was already speaking to me when I asked her, saying she's such an idiot because she lost her phone. She added that she's been looking for it here. Where we were standing, it was a well-lit area, being just outside the dorms, so I thought maybe I could help her find it. I offered to help, and she asked if I could call her number off of my phone, and maybe we could hear it ringing. We do that, but hear nothing. The whole time, she keeps muttering to herself how she's such an idiot. She also kept telling me that she lost it while going out for a smoke. 
She said it multiple times, as if she really wanted me to know this. She then suggested that we go down to the creek adjacent to the dorms that's about 30 meters away to look. It's completely blanketed by darkness and surrounded by trees. I was thinking to myself, how the fuck would you have lost your phone there when you said you lost it here 30 meters away? I didn't feel threatened by her physically, seeing as I'm a six foot man, but I didn't know what was going to happen if I followed her into the dark trees down to the creek. So I say, didn't you say it's up here somewhere though? She replies, saying she's not sure, and there's a chance it's down by the creek. I tell her that I'll stay up here and call the phone when she gets to the creek. She insists that she needs me to help her find it down there. At this point, I'm contemplating whether or not she really lost her phone. I finally say to her, Look, I'm not comfortable following a stranger into the woods in the middle of the night. She responds, pleading that she really needs my help and nothing's going to happen. I say that I'm sorry. I turn around and head back inside to my dorm. Where my room is, it allows me to look outside at the area that this all took place. So when I get back into my room on the second floor, I peek out the window. The girl is gone. Every 30 seconds or so, I take another peek. Eventually, in the distance, I spot a man wander past, coming from the direction of the creek. He then disappears behind some buildings, and I don't see anything else weird. I'm almost certain that if I followed the girl to the creek, something bad would have happened to me. This is not my story, but I have an add-on to it. There was a home in the middle of nowhere near Spanish Fork, Utah. Someone I know worked there as a staff member. It was a residential treatment facility for young, troubled boys. When the company moved and relocated to a building just down the road a ways, this one remained empty and just sat there. The guy I know, Matt, is a great guy and loves telling stories. He always has great tales of things that he or someone he knows has experienced, but this story in particular happened to him. One night, he worked a bit later than usual. He decided instead of driving the 45 minutes home, he would just go stay at the old house. The night started off as normal. He cooked some dinner and watched a movie on his phone while laying on a bed in the basement. As he watched the movie, he heard footsteps upstairs, but the only thing was, the footsteps went in a straight line and continued through what he knew to be a solid wall. There was no access, multiple walls in fact. He debated whether he should investigate. First, he called someone else who he knew would sometimes stay there as well to see if they were there that night. They said, no, I'm already at home in my own bed. Why? He explained it to them and they decide the sounds are just the house settling. He turned the light off and went to sleep. A couple hours later, at around midnight, he heard a door open and shut in the basement. Then he heard the door right across from the room he was sleeping in do the same thing. Now he was freaked out. Someone was in the house with him. He reached down to his bag and grabbed a knife. All of a sudden, there was a ton of noise coming from the room across the hall, loud banging and things dropping. But there were only files in that room, a filing cabinet and papers, no books or other heavy objects. Then the lights in the hall turned on and after about 30 seconds, turned back off before the sounds began again. He was in bed in absolute fear and horror of the sounds he was hearing. They continued to get louder and louder, and all of a sudden, everything went dead silent. Silence, as in he couldn't even hear power anymore. The heater wasn't going, and he said he felt everything going cold, too suddenly for it to be caused by the lack of power. He was frozen, and all he could do was lay there, imagining something opening the door and charging at him. 
He imagined that over and over again until the sun came up. As soon as it did, though, he grabbed his stuff and left the room. He peeked into the room across the hall, and nothing was out of the ordinary. He then left the house and never stayed there again. Less than one week later, the house burned down mysteriously. Investigators couldn't find out what caused it. Fast forward to a year later, I was with him and a bunch of guys, and we set up a paintball course on the property for the boys. We tested it out, but while sitting down, taking a break, I felt like I was being watched. I looked around and saw nothing, but then from the corner of my eye, I noticed what looked like a head in the window of the basement. I stood up and looked down the window well, and sure enough, there was someone there, staring right at me. It was the face of what looked to be a young girl, long dark hair, maybe around 13 or 14, and her skin was very, very pale. She stared at me for what felt like an eternity. I was frozen. I couldn't move. This was daytime, and she was in the shadow of the window. Matt called out to me and shot me with a paintball gun, which snapped me out of the trance I was in. I looked over and yelled out to him, but when I looked back, the girl was gone. He came over and told me that I looked extremely pale. He asked if I was okay. I pointed to the window and told him what I saw. He looked at me wide-eyed and told me that that was the window to the room all the sounds came from the year prior. We both moved away from the house back into the wooded area to the paintball course and never approached the house again. We never spoke of that incident to anyone or even each other. I sometimes would remember it, and I know he did, too. I would catch him giving me a weird look, and I knew we both remembered, but neither of us would mention it. I'm not big into paranormal activity, nor do I really believe in ghosts, but that was truly horrifying, and it probably should be enough to make me believe. I used to be naively helpful to all sorts of strangers and often picked up hitchhikers, solo and in groups, and I'd get them to where they needed to go. When I was 19, I'd moved to Huntington, a college town in West Virginia, and I worked at a popular bar. My shifts would start at around 9pm and end at about 2am. I didn't know anybody in this town or state even and I'd been there on my own for only a month or so. On one of these nights, one of the customers had taken an interest in conversing with me while I was working my shift. Me being a good employee, conversed pleasantly back. He was in his 30s or 40s, buzzed white hair, with a group of other guys, all of them tattooed and with leather jackets. He had been there going back and forth between them at their table and me at the bar pretty much talking to me non-stop for a good couple of hours. At around 1.30 a.m., he mentions he doesn't know where his friends went. I look up, oblivious, and see the whole bar had virtually cleared out. He was right. Not one of his buddies was in sight. He says they must have all gotten drunk and forgotten about him, leaving him there. The man is clearly bummed and concerned because as he tells me, he lives almost an hour away from here and has no way of getting home now, and it's the middle of winter. It's snowing really hard. He spends the next few minutes on the phone, calling the different friends that were at the bar with him, but no one is answering. I can't leave him in the bar. I can't in good conscience leave the man out in the snow. So fuck, now I've got to drive this stranger home in a place I'm unfamiliar with. In conditions, I've never really driven in before. I tell him don't worry. When I finish cleaning the bar and closing up, I'll take him home. And I do. We get in the car, and he gives me directions as we go. We're talking casually like we had been. Just superficial conversation. 
Nothing even hinting at sexual or flirty. I'm not a flirty person, so I'm positive there was no misunderstanding here. Keep in mind, it's like two in the morning. No one knows where I am or that I'm with this random person, and it's snowing heavily. As we're chatting, suddenly I feel his hand on the back of my neck. It was such an unpleasant feeling. I remember his fingers swirling in the little hairs at the bottom of my hairline, which were too short to make it into the ponytail. Uh, I scrunched my neck and just calmly said, I have a knife, as I kept looking forward, driving. The swirling ceased, but the hand lingered on my skin. Again, calmly but more firmly, I said, I have a knife. He removed his hand and we kept driving. I figure whatever that was is handled and we get back to our conversation. Minutes later, I feel his hand fully against the back of my neck, his fingers wrapped gently around its curve. I scrunched my neck again and said, Seriously, I have a knife. I have a knife. He removed his hand once more and then in a very hurt tone said, are you really scared of me? After that, he kept his hands to himself. It was a long one hour drive, but I got him home and I took off. I'm 29 now, and it wasn't until many years later did it occur to me that the whole thing was probably a setup that he and his friends had planned. They probably left him stranded so that the chick he's been talking to all night will have to take him home. Moral of the story, don't let people you don't know in your car and also carry a knife. Growing up in the Appalachian Mountains, I could give you a million times as a kid and young adult that I felt scared or paranoid playing in the woods. It's a beautiful place, and I spent my entire childhood getting lost out there by myself or with friends. As kids, we never got too far out there, but you actually could see the progression of us venturing further and further out as we got older, due to the forts and carvings we would leave. This one particular time, like a thousand times before, my friend and I had just graduated high school, it was our last summer of freedom, and we spent the entire summer camping and hiking out there. We had decided to try and find a new place to set up camp, and walked for what felt like a few miles before we came to a nice clearing. The area was relatively new to both of us. We got the camp set up and fire going, and the plan was to wait until nightfall, smoke some weed, and play some Monopoly. For sake of backstory on my friend and I, my buddy is a smaller, real goofy guy, but he comes from a family of foresters and always had a deep understanding of all the trees and different plants you came across. He had no fear of going and camping out by himself. If I spent 10,000 hours in the woods, he probably spent 50,000. As for me, I'm a taller, sturdier guy, and as we got older, I spent more time worried about women and sports and the woods became a place for small parties. Also, I never had the balls to camp out alone. In fact, older me wouldn't go far at all when I was alone, because I could never shake the feeling of being watched, which was just paranoia, but it was still an uneasy feeling. Anyway, camp is set, fire is going, but it's getting lower and needs wood. Sun is down and we're both cutting up and having a good time. My friend is sitting on this little chair he always brought and loading up the makeshift bong, and I was crouched breaking some excess limbs off some of the logs we gathered for the fire. All of a sudden, this strong breeze cuts through the clearing. I couldn't tell you if it was the suddenness of it or what, but my friend and I both stopped immediately and looked at each other. The breeze went just long enough to flicker our fire down to a small flame. We both sat still in almost total darkness, neither of us said a word. Across from us on the other side of the fire, we could hear footsteps. They sounded like someone was running and would slow down to a walk and then run again. 
definitely on two legs. By the sound of it, they were pacing back and forth over the same spot. Then, just like it had started, it stopped with a softer crunch on the underbrush. I knew by the sound of it they'd taken a crouch. I was crouched still and knew I was staring right at it in the dark. My friend grabbed my shoulder and said, Buddy. And when he did, I felt this surge of fear come over me. I could feel it and hear it in him. I'd been so fixed on the footsteps and rationalizing what I'd heard that I hadn't even considered being afraid. But this was true fear. It was raw and made me feel helpless. I could hear my friend after a while grab some leaves and he dropped them on the fire. For the split second the leaves covered the fire, we were in pure darkness. Then the fire sprang to life. We both quickly grabbed more leaves and brush and threw it onto the fire. I got some sticks and logs on there, and neither of us took our eyes off the spot or moved much for over an hour. Finally, the leaves crunched and it slowly walked off. Whatever it was had sat crouched watching us without moving for far longer than any animal would. It wasn't until after those footsteps disappeared that I realized the smell had disappeared as well. It smelled like a paper mill, spoiled eggs almost. For the rest of the night, besides whispered remarks, neither of us really moved or stopped looking at that spot. Nobody went into the tent, and I had very short light sleep sitting on the ground with my head rested on my hands. My friend never went to sleep. In the morning we packed up and silently walked home. To this day we talk about it. In the seven to eight years since it happened, my forester friend has not camped out there by himself since. This isn't exactly something I saw, but I heard and felt it. My dad and I went backpacking in the Yosemite National Park in California, and we stopped in a valley to camp for the night. In the middle of the night, I woke up to the sound of at least a dozen of what sounded like deer sprint right past our tent, followed by a loud thud behind our tent, and the forest going dead silent. I've been camping my whole life, and I've never heard silence like that in a forest. Not even a leaf was blowing in the wind. Something instinctively inside me made my whole body freeze. I couldn't breathe. I had goosebumps. My heart was racing. I was petrified. As I laid there frozen, I swear on my life, I could hear whatever made that loud thud start tiptoeing around our tent. I say tiptoeing because the steps were so soft and careful that it felt intentional, like it was investigating our tent, and I could feel its presence moving around the tent. After what felt like a lifetime, but it was only probably five to ten minutes, a branch snapped somewhere in the forest, followed by a loud whoosh of wind, and the forest just went back to normal. I want to say it was a mountain lion, just curious about our tent or something, and that's what I told myself the rest of our trip so I could sleep at night. But the horrible, horrible pit in my stomach and fear that washed over me was nothing like I've ever felt before or since, and it has convinced me that there are things in the forest far worse than people realize. I used to work in a casino. One night I was approached by an elderly woman asking about paging someone over the intercom. I tried explaining where to go but she insisted I personally walk her to the desk where they can do that. As I walk her through the casino, she started talking to me. She mentioned she was a medium, and how her family always strictly advised her against sharing that information with people. When you work in a casino, you encounter a lot of scammers and odd people. I was polite, but tried not to engage with her much on the topic. As we kept walking, she said something to me about my sister. I stopped and asked how she knew my sister. 
She didn't, but started talking to me at great lengths about my family. At this particular time, my sister was going through a very difficult time in life that was impacting our family as a whole. I was skeptical, but curious. As she went on, I was careful to neither confirm or deny anything, but just listen to what she had to say. She went into great detail about how my father, mother, and even I played into the current situation. She even began to become visibly emotional, as if she could feel what my mother was feeling. I was utterly astonished, as she told me that I, being the oldest and most diplomatic in my family dynamic, needed to be more outspoken with everyone involved. Everything she had told me was undeniably accurate and insightful, but then she shifted her focus. She told me about someone I worked with, and went into great detail about what this person looked like and how they felt about me. She talked about the dynamic between us, and advised me to take caution. At this point, she'd lost me. I couldn't think of a single person or relationship in my working life that fit that description. I began becoming more skeptical again and reminded her I needed to get back to work and to keep walking towards our destination. She kept talking to me as we walked and I began to once again find myself astonished as to not just what she was telling me but also how she would go about it, her body language, expressions, and emotional energy. As we got closer, she abruptly stopped walking. When I noticed, I did as well and turned back to her. Before I could say anything, she placed her palm at the base of my sternum. I immediately noticed a physical sensation. I became paralyzed and almost felt like she was stealing the breath from my body. I started becoming hyper aware of my surroundings, the lights and dings from the electronic games, the mass amounts of people walking by, but everything seemed to be in slow motion, or almost as if I was leaving my body. It could have been only a few seconds, it could have been 20 minutes, I don't know, but I felt as if I couldn't breathe, and there was weakness in my knees. I started to feel like I was on the verge of passing out. Casino security saw this encounter and approached us. When security interrupted us to ask what was going on, it must have startled her because I felt the shockwave through my entire body. She jerked her hand back and started apologizing profusely to me. As soon as she pulled her hand back, I was able to breathe again and gain control of my body. I was completely freaked out. It must have been visible because security kept asking me if I was okay. I assured them everything was fine, and they walked off. I turned back to the woman who was still apologizing, and she said, If you don't do something about that ulcer, it's going to kill you. I was so freaked out, I told her thanks, but I have to get back to work now, and quickly headed back to my office. Not only was I in a bizarre headspace, but I was noticeably completely void of physical energy. The entire experience was the most profound encounter of my life, and I will never forget those words and physical sensation. I was having a lot of stomach issues at the time, but I was far too scared to get medical verification of an ulcer. I previously suspected it, and it was a potential side effect of the medication I was on at the time, but if that wasn't bizarre enough on its own, it gets even weirder. This encounter happened nearly ten years ago, and it has sat with me ever since, but recently I was reflecting back on it. I realized that the second part about the co-worker that initially made no sense at all, all of a sudden it did. That entire situation played out in my life a few years ago. The description of the person and the very specific details were 100% spot on from what was described to me 10 years ago. I even realized that the entire situation was initiated nearly seven years ago from the moment this woman described it to me. Not only were the two incidents separated by seven years, but the person she described I hadn't even met yet and was in an entirely different state and company. I don't know what to make of this. I've come here to see everyone else's take on it. I'm open to this kind of stuff, but I've always approached these situations skeptically. I'd love to hear what anyone has to say about it.
I was 29. I was having chest pains. They were reminiscent of when I was younger. I rushed to the hospital just for it to be heartburn. I started treatment for that, but it got to a point where I couldn't move. I was sent home from work and went to my doctor. I described everything and said it just felt like bad heartburn. The doctor starts looking at stuff and treating me for GERDs. Just as she's about to send me on my way, she says she wants to do an EKG. After the results, she brought in a more experienced doctor who agreed with her and said that they want to keep me overnight for observation. I get to the hospital and they hook me up with a ton of devices. There are multiple tests and they start medicating me. All they told me before I fell asleep from the meds was I had an enlarged and weakened left ventricle. It's now maybe 3 a.m. I'm awoken to the creepiest looking doctor ever. He had this skeleton thin body but with a round pot belly. Think Farnsworth from Futurama. He was bald, but with this greasy stringy hair that was like long, and he draped a few over his head. Meanwhile, I'm still drugged out and afraid of what's going on. He pulls up a chair and asks if I know what's going on. He says I had a nibble of a heart attack, using his pointer finger and thumb to indicate very small. He explains something about numbers and if they hit a certain number, it indicates a heart attack. And mine hit the number directly next to it. So let's say 10 means a heart attack. I hit a 9. Bear in mind, my dad died of a heart attack when he was 39. I'm laying there freaked out. Everyone I know is asleep, so I have no one to talk to. I'm too drugged out to do anything. I just push the button for more drugs to go back to sleep. They did a heart catheter and said my arteries were clean. Months later, I found I had a flu-like virus that went untreated. It reached my heart before my body fought it off. I'd gone to a MedExpress place a month before because I was sick with flu-like symptoms, but they lasted two weeks. The doctor said, it's the flu. You're young, you'll get over it. And he never did any tests. I had to wear a heart defibrillator for about four months after that and I'm on heart medication for the rest of my life. All because the express doc was too lazy to test anything. But that night shift doctor looked like death. And I thought he was coming to tell me that I died. For context, I'm a 27 year old male, 6 foot, and about 210 pounds, and definitely don't frighten easy. So a few months ago, I made a trip up to the local gas station to grab some beer. I walked in like usual, and noticed a new guy working the register. He says hello in a friendly tone as I walk past, and I do the same in return. I go to the back and grab my beer and walk to the front. Very typical, nothing out of the ordinary. So I set my beer on the counter, and this is where it happened. I made eye contact with the new guy, and instantly my blood ran cold, and my adrenaline rushed. My fight or flight was triggered, and I could feel every hair on my body standing on end. It almost seemed time slowed to a crawl, and this guy was just staring through my soul. I can barely describe the instant sense of danger and impending doom. Every part of my being was screaming, you're in danger, run now. All of this was in the span of a couple of seconds, but it felt like an eternity. And the silence was broken when he said what my total was. I was unable to break eye contact. It was impossible while I fumbled with my wallet. I set a $5 bill on the counter and quickly walked out, not even waiting for my change. I had a massive panic attack in my truck and almost crashed on my way home. I told my wife what happened. She chalked it up to, a guy scared me. I told my friends about it and they thought I was insane. I stopped talking about it, but the feeling and the image of this guy were stuck with me. A week or so after that encounter, I had a low tire on my trailer, so I stopped at that same gas station. I had change on me, so I wouldn't have to go inside for any reason. 
While I'm crouching down, airing up my tire, I start getting the same intense feeling. That feeling of danger, the feeling of panic, and that I need to run. Confused yet alert, I lift my head to look around. This guy is glaring at me from the window of the gas station. Blank expression, just staring me down like I'm being sized up or something. He watches me get in my truck and drive away, and I swear, I didn't see him blink once. The next day, I've had enough, and I'm getting to the bottom of this, damn it. So I decide I'm going to talk to this guy and figure out what the hell is going on, because this isn't right. I get to the gas station, and it's the usual lady working. I asked her about the new guy and when he'd be back around. She told me he actually quit working there that day. I was relieved and confused at the same time, but I figured I could finally forget about all that strange shit and move on. I haven't seen that guy since, but that feeling and that face still remains burned in my head like it was yesterday. I still don't go to that gas station, just so I don't have to think about it. Anyway, has this ever happened to you guys? I've tried talking to people and they always give me the same shit about it. If anyone has a clue on what could have caused this, please let me know. Thanks for listening. This took place around 15 years ago. I would have been about 13 years old. My dad has always taken an annual fishing trip with friends that would put him out of state for about a week. I have numerous stories about weird things happening while he was gone on said fishing trips, from paranormal events to someone attempting to break into our house, but this one is the most unnerving to people when I tell it. When my dad would go on these trips, I would usually sleep in my parents' bed. My mom and I treated it like a little sleepover and would watch movies, stay up late and gossip, even on school nights. I remember falling asleep after a late night movie and being roused from sleep what felt like just minutes later. My mom is a light sleeper, while on the other hand, it takes a catastrophic level event to wake me up from a dead sleep. I remember waking up feeling as if something was wrong. The room was illuminated oddly and there was a distant rhythm I was only partially aware of. I'm half asleep. And as I open my eyes, I can see my mom on top of the bed, on her knees, peering out of the window above her bed. I started to ask, what's going on, when she turned to me quickly and shushed me. I quietly joined her looking out of the small box window that was slightly cracked open, and the distant, rhythmic chanting became more and more clear. Our house sat in front of a strip of woods. The trees aren't too thick, and you can't see through most of the wooded area. The chanting was getting louder by the second, and the odd illuminations finally made sense. You could see a line of hooded figures in dark clothes, holding torches marching east, chanting what sounded like demonic, dark things. It felt surreal and scary as we held our breath waiting to see what they would do. Were they headed towards the houses to burn them down? Were they going to attempt to break in and sacrifice us? It felt like ages that we sat there, watching this line of people walk through the woods, their torches raised high, and their chanting continuing through the night. But that was it. They just walked away. After what was probably more like two minutes, my mom and I laid back down and discussed what we saw, trying to get back to sleep. We told my dad first thing in the morning when he called to check in, but I remember him not believing us. He thought it had to be a dream or something. That kind of thing didn't happen in our small town in Ohio. But the next day, there was an article in the local newspaper about a lamb being slain on a makeshift altar on the east side of my town. My dad stopped doubting us, and my mom and I got even more freaked out. My parents still live in that house, and we've never seen any other cult-like behavior in the area. 
But that one evening freaked us out enough that I decided to permanently camp out in my parents' bedroom every time my dad left town until my late high school years. If you stuck around, I appreciate it. Thanks for listening and allowing me to get my story out there. My friends and I were reminiscing about creepy stories this weekend. This one came up, and I haven't stopped thinking about it since. So I wanted to write it down and share. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you'd like me to read on the channel, please send me an email or post it to my subreddit. You can find details of this in the video description. It's the stories that make this, and this is the best way to ensure variety in the stories I share. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my channel members and patrons who now have special access to ad-free videos and other behind-the-scenes content. Hospital Cakewalk. Dirty Diana, Quinta Siegel, Shirley Porch, Taylor Ruist, Annalisa Petrie, Jasmine Davis, Janelle Jensen, Jasper Roth, Alex, Monica Levelace, James Gargano, Sarah P, Fire 05, Mad as a Felter, Tierra Sanders, Melissa Kingery, Kitty Cat Luna 2, Chelsea Moffat, Ryan, Gabrielle, Jenny, Sarah, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Sam, Amanda Jane, Vampy Debs, October Gypsy, Rebecca, Erica B, Maribel De Luna, Lloyd Rash, Jennifer Jenkins, Kelly Townsend, Mary Wright, Tara Harris, Elizabeth Knapp, Eddie, Sean Gorman, Sue Gordon, Spider's Web, Kay, Christy, Absinthe Alice, Dina Kingery, Snowball Rathena, Lady Drackard, Brenda, Pretty Girl 215, Amber Davis, Sigma Cube X, Leticia Acklin, Ali O'Neill, Gina Eberhardt, Lilypad, Ashley Nicole, Sarah Chifalo, May 2nd, 2003. Bella Plays 2006, Skin Crawler, Stephanie McLaren, Borderline Betty, Kuro, Top Off, Kelly Ann Bain, Michael O'Malley, Neil Kavanagh, The Dead Movie Society, Diana Johnston, Taya Adwell, Danielle, Possum Posse, Crafty Kell, Brooke, Scott McKenzie, Megan Abrams, Jane Wiggins, Jasmine Davis, Jack White, Your Pappy's Dilly, Emma Lisa, Tanya Ferguson, The Wendy, Ember Hops, Alexia Tuttle, Ram Beltran, Elizabeth Mayers, Unladylike 13, Pegasus Genesis, Sheila Grant 44, Sona, Scout Mom 405, Cheryl Duckworth, Ashley Bray, Angela Reeves, Kim Thompson, Brock Bollard, Nick Bigdowski, Jessica Lasley, Yennefer, Clary Scott, Timothy Stratton, Melissa Kingery, Shane Stevens, Serge Vargas, Bart in Real Life, April Jordanet, Lisa Prentice, Mason Hayes, Sarah Price, Jasmine Thomas, Angie Lindop, Z Harris, Kirby Harris, Yolo Sapien, Lavina Cordelia, Misty Racour, Michelle Green, Dixie Busby, Paula Ferreira Nieves, Samantha Place, Donna Cox, Stephen Wheeler, Melissa Moore, Deshaun Edmondson, This Bad Kitty, Gloria, Christina Myway, Connie Sue, Carol Zeferano, Merciful Humming, Kelsa Rundle, Ashley Juster, Vicki Howell, Joe Tozer, Zoe D. Nicholas Johnson, Kimmy Love. Once again, thank you guys for listening. Have a great night.